Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your part number four, where we are going to discuss the next twenty questions for the test number five. I hope you have enjoyed the test. You have learned a lot of things from the from the uh, uh, previous few parts that we have discussed. And if by chance you have not yet checked out the test series of the PMF IS team. then i recommend you to test uh, to check out this test series the link is given in description below it's available at a very special price of just 499 and this is going to offer you 1000 high quality mcqs so do check them out and it is very very important for practice uh, for practicing as many questions as possible because that's what upsc prelims is all about practice practice and practice so let us get started with the question number 61 well this question was with respect to the global warming potential of the greenhouse gases we know a lot of things about the greenhouse gases but what about this so called global warming potential first learn that and then we'll come back to the question there are two things in the question one the question is about the global warming potential 100 gwp 100 what is this gwp 100 guys this is actually a metric which is generally used to measure the global warming potential of a greenhouse gases over a 100 year time frame so here the 100 signifies the time okay so today if any greenhouse gas is getting emitted in the next 100 years how much global warming that gas is going to make that's what it is the global warming potential for a 100 time 100 year time frame please remember whenever we use the word global warming potential it is it is always a relative measure where we fix carbon dioxide we take it as our base and we compare the global warming potential of any global uh, uh, greenhouse gas how how much uh, uh, global warming it is to it is going to do in comparison with the co2 co2 is a standard that we take like for example you can see if carbon dioxide has a global warming potential of 1 it is very relative value it, it is taken as a base and if i say sir methane has a global warming potential of 28 means uh, methane is going to do 28 times more global warming than the co2 and similarly you can see nitro nitro nitrous oxide having global warming potential of 265 times and look at this crazy number sulfur hexafluoride 22800 times more global warming than we have than uh, than the carbon dioxide okay so this is a relative way we are measuring very similarly like the way we have this global warming potential 100 kind of unit there is another unit called as global warming potential with the asterisk marks basically this is not specified for how much time we are calculating so basically this global warming potential with a star mark it is actually calculated over any specific time period it is very open so if you have to compare the two so clearly where there was a time frame with the first category this category it is specifically for any time and that is why it is more accurate for the short lived gases as well where global warming potential 100 parameter was majorly focusing on the long lived gases now very interestingly uh since it is very specific the nature of the use is very specific it is not really widely used whereas this 100 year as a standard frame is what we widely use and even it is simpler to calculate as compared to the other one so if you know these two facts then you can come back to the question and let's see what the question says the question says this global warming potential 100 metric unit it is used to measure the global warming potential over a 100 year time frame absolutely correct then it says unlike this the star mark can be calculated over a specified time period so very obviously and i think very it is very easy for you to predict the 100 as a 100 year time frame as well no so this is a very basic topic global warming potential greenhouse gases climate change very basic topic uh the question was a medium one but something you could have attempted very easily because uh, the statements are very clear and there is no twist and turn in that right takes us to the question number 62 which which is about the emission gap report 2023 very very important report 
absolutely important question guys now let's first understand about the report and then we'll come back so there are every time i told you n number of times whenever you read about any report any index the first thing you have to look for that report or index is prepared published by which particular organization in the case of emission gap report it is united nation environment program unep that releases this report on annual basis very interestingly the word is gap what do you think just apply your logic what what can be the emission gap emission gap means currently all the global greenhouse gases that are being emitted and the levels that we need to limit them so that to, we can limit the overall global warming so this gap of actual emission and the required emission that particular gap is called the emission gap we you know when in 2015 we signed the paris agreement which is one of the landmark agreement on the climate change where the where we decided that you know the global warming the global temperature must not exceed 1.5 and maximum it can rise up to 2 degree by the end of the century okay so that gap so if, if we are if we are not going to reduce this gap we are not likely to achieve the target more and more emissions are always going to nullify all the efforts that we are taking care of this time 2023 emission gap report has actually gave us some very crucial inputs insights about how the world is going to its climate destiny how i am saying that as per the report in 2023 alone almost 3 months like approximately 86 days were those days where the there was a breaching of this 1.5 degree temperature threshold 86 days were more than what required and similarly the report also give us a warning that if the current policies globally whatever country doing whatever for the climate change if the current policies continue without any much efforts the global warming is estimated to reach up to 3 degree forget about 1.5 or 2 by the end of the century we will be ending up with this this is something which is very very warming now you you can ask me sir i mean what does how 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 much difference is that what is the difference between it's just 1 1 1/2 degree guys even a 1 degree temperature globally can cause havoc 1 degree imagine 1 degree celsius change can lead to faster glacier melting uh, it is going to rise the sea level by 6 to 8 cm you can imagine coastal floods and so many things can happen even 0.5 degree is worst you can imagine what 1 degree can do right so this report has has gave us all the insights and it says right now with the current policy framework there are only 14% chances that we are likely to limit the global warming to 1.5 degree so now if you come to the question you can say all the three statements here are absolutely correct now very easy to predict see all the reports unep uh, uh, not just this emission gap report in fact all the reports which are published by unep are very crucial for your exam and very interestingly very importantly as you can you can easily uh, guess the meaning of this emission gap and yes this is something if you are reading the news on a regular basis you can easily predict this question was a medium level could have been attempted easily answer is your d all the three statements are absolutely correct now very next question is very simple question very straight forward question a 30 cross 30 target it is not about solar power generation not about sustainable agriculture practices nothing to do with covid this is the right answer b prevent biodiversity loss and address the climate change yesterday we had a discussion i told you about the coming montreal global biodiversity framework if you guys remember and yesterday only i told you that this is one of the most important framework today that we have with respect to the biodiversity so this 30 cross 30 target is actually one of the components of this biodiversity framework very easy question very straight forward uh, question because this topic is very very important for the exam so what exactly is the 30 cross 30 target it's a global initiative one of the major components of this framework like i told you yesterday also this global initiative has an aim to safeguard 30% of the world's terrestrial and marine areas 
by 2030. Please understand this 30% area that, that this initiative wants to product includes both terrestrial as well as marine. And that is why the name is 30 cross 30. 2030 is the target year and 30% is what we, we want to protect. Presently, as of now, 2023, the protected areas, almost 16% of the world's terrestrial areas are protected areas and 8% of the world marine area is protected. Of course, we want to increase it. You can see. So, of course, there is a challenge. From 16%, we want to make it 30%. And the real challenge lies here. I mean, it is, it is way more difficult how, how we are going to protect 30% of the marine area where you really have to stretch a lot in the next coming up, coming up of six years. So of course, protecting 30% marine area is going to be a big challenge. But now you know the basics of this uh, concept. So you can predict. Next question is very, very fact based question. It is straightforward asking you about the Amazon River Turtle. And you have absolutely no clue. And in fact, let me tell you guys, these kind of question when there is a question directly on any biodiversity, it's actually very tricky. In my opinion, in my opinion, generally, you never go, you don't really get all the four statements correct. Though in this case, all the four are correct, but there are only 10% chances that all four are going to get the correct one. So be very careful because these are the questions which really do not give you much scope. It, it is talking about one biodiversity in that too, very specific. First, we'll learn about the Amazon turtle, then we'll come back. So the yellow spotted Amazon turtles, uh, they are also called as side neck turtles. They are native to South America because Amazon River we have in South America. Now, it is indigenous to Amazon River in the Southern America. And these turtles, please remember this interesting fact. These turtles, they live in a freshwater environment. Now, this is a star mark. <clears throat> you never know. The UPSC can twist the statement by saying that they are brackish water. But Amazon turtles live in a freshwater environment, river stream floodplains. In which country we find them in predominant base? Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Guinea. These are the countries which have the prominent population of these spotted Amazon turtles. IUCN status is must. You must and must read about the IUCN status of every species that is in news. Talking about the Amazon turtle, they are vulnerable. Now, very interestingly, the extended heat wave and drought period, they have shortened the incubation period for hatching of the Amazon turtle. So you see that the climate change, any these are the results of climate change. So climate change is affecting the incubation period for the hatching of the Amazon turtle. And this is not just the end. This is a beginning. You can imagine how worst situation can happen because of the climate change. Normally, the uh, you know, normal times, the incubation period of the Amazon turtles used to be 60 to 72 days. But now due to climate change, due to increased temperature, that incubation has reduced to 45 days. Okay, now these are important points that you can think of. And if you look at the statement, guys, all the four statements are absolutely correct. Now, my suggestion, in my opinion, of course, these kind of questions are a little bit tough because you really cannot make sure that if the numbers are correct or not, you know, the, if the if the areas are not. So, of course, there are many tricks and turns in that. In my opinion, if you are not sure, if you have not read these kind of things, you can skip these kind of questions. But if in case you want to attempt, since here, at least you have the option of elimination, you can try to eliminate the statements. If you can eliminate any of them, then the things become easy. Okay, now in this case, and even the next question, 65, is also of the same nature. Question 65 is about the ghoul fish. Because it is in Indian context, I would recommend you, at least you should read about the ghoul fish a lot. Why? Because recently, this fish in 2023 was declared the state fish of Gujarat. So you never know that you have a direct question, which of the following species became the state fish of Gujarat? Or ghoul fish became the state fish of which of the following states? The question can be asked either ways. And since it is very recently that has happened, there are all the chances that you may get a question on the goldfish. Goldfish is also called as black spotted croaker fish. And let me tell you, it is one of the largest fish that we have in India. Be careful about the largest and the smallest one. 
UPSC may trick you by saying goldfish are the smallest one. No, they are the largest fish in India. Where exactly they are found? It is not just restricted to India, guys. When you when you call when you uh, talk about the goldfish, they are found in the entire Indo-Pacific region, right from the Persian Gulf to the Pacific Oceans. So the the distribution is wide of them. They inhabit the marine neritic zone. Neritic zones are basically shallow waters. Uh, you know, up to the up to the first two hundred meters. So if you if you look at the ocean, the first two hundred meter is called a neritic zone, the shallow water zone, or the water which is above the continental shelf. So that is again. So they are not very deep dwellers. They are found in the shallow waters. Uh, what about the IUCN status? They are near threatened. So far near threatened and and they are very significant guys. You can see the uh, fish in front of you. They are very significant. Why? They are used to make beer and even the wine. And their air bladder is actually used in the pharmaceutical. So it has application in beauty, application in pharma. And you can see the distribution. All this area is where you find these fishes. The ghol fish. State fish of Gujarat now. Question number 66, which statement is correct with respect to the ozone hole? Let me tell you one very first very very basic thing. Ozone hole, don't think that there is a uh, you know there is a ozone and there are holes in that. That is not the case at all. The word ozone hole actually denotes that there is thinning of the ozone layer. Ozone layer is getting thinned. So thinning of the ozone layer or you can simply use the word ozone depletion that what exactly the ozone hole is about ozone holes today we have the major ozone holes on antarctica and even arctic region is experiencing that ozone depletion ozone hole is always going to be maximum at the poles right now please understand what this particular statement says now this statement says now in this question Normally, uh, the amount, the volume of the ozone is measured in a unit called as Dobson unit. So please remember, Dobson unit is that that measures the amount of the ozone. In normal case, normal scenario, you know, ozone is present within the stratosphere. So in stratosphere, uh, which, which is from 13 kilometer to 50 kilometer, ozone lies somewhere in between. Approximately 25 kilometer is the average height of the ozone layer which is also called the ozonosphere or the chemosphere and in normal scenario the ozone composition is approximately 350 Dobson unit that is a normal composition but when the depletion starts and if by chance the the composition the amount of the ozone depletes below the 220 Dobson unit it gets below 220 Dobson then the word is used as ozone hole. So ozone hole is that area where ozone levels dropped below 220 Dobson unit. This is absolutely correct. Antarctic hole is a, is a larger one. It's a thinner one and it may take longer to recover due to the mesosphere. So both statements in this case are absolutely correct. Answer is C. Uh, question was very easy, very simple because we have read a lot, a lot, a lot about the ozone ozone depletion and all that stuff okay guys i hope that thing is clear to you uh, yes as you can move forward and here are the layers so you can see where the stratosphere is where the mesosphere is <clears throat> so you have the options question number 67 question 67 you have to figure out about the e-commerce sector now this this kind of question for these kind of questions i always recommend you to read more and more about the economic survey. All the students out there do read economic survey before you go to your prelims because do expect at least two to four questions coming on economic survey as well. Which economic survey? The latest one. Now, <clears throat> okay, let's see that I'm not very sure with the numbers. Can I solve this question with my common sense? Yes, I can solve this question of e-commerce sector in India because see as a customer we are we are also consumer of e-commerce right we we do a lot of shopping so we are also connected to e-commerce in our real life just imagine and try to solve this question when it comes to e-commerce sector 
it is the fast growing sect uh, in india's e-commerce is the fast growing of course because india's economy is fast growing indian india's digital footprint is fast moving so of course india's e-commerce sector is also fastest growing sector in the world in fact india's e-commerce sector is going to surpass united states and india is likely to become the second largest e-commerce market by 2034 after china china is still the one likely to remain number one that statement looks pretty good pretty fine so any statement having not the option number one i am going to eliminate it so my only options are a c and d now look at the second statement it says and okay first after first read the third statement now given that india's e-commerce is growing so fast imagine how government is going to push it further or why it has happened because probably government allows 100 percent fdi in single brand retail in any in one of the key drivers is one of the key driver of the e-commerce growth in india of course without government support without 100 percent fdi such tremendous growth is not possible so first and third are very much connected to me so i can eliminate these options as well my only chances are these two now you can read the statement number two now of course at least as a consumer as citizens of india we know the reality of the e-commerce it, now this says india's online retail market is 40 percent of the total retail market and 25 percent of the organized retail market well this really looks an exaggeration india is still not at that level where we are having major share as retail market as online market we are still not into that domain if that would happen i'm sure we are going to leave china behind as well so statement number three uh, two is not the correct one because this is these numbers are too big for me to digest right so my answer is going to be c so this question may look tough but it was something you could have attempted by understanding the reality of e-commerce because you yourself are the consumer of that e-commerce as far as india's uh, share is concerned india's online retail market is just three percent of the total retail market in india people still prefer to go out and do the shopping in real only three percent people like you and me we are always on mintra amazon this and that right but uh, three only three percent majority people still like like to go out and do the shopping that is fine that of the total retail market 25 percent of the organized market is the is the uh, online one but of the total retail it is still just a three percent i hope that makes sense guys okay so now that takes us to the next question number 68 this question is about the capital market very core topic very very core topic tough topic in fact i would say of indian economy so first let's understand the capital market and then we'll come back to the question number 68 so <clears throat> what we have we are supposed to learn about the capital market why it is in news first place government of india has recently allowed some indian companies to list directly on specific foreign stock exchanges this was not allowed earlier so government of india in 2020 amended the companies act and now it, it has allowed indian companies to directly list themselves on on some specific stock exchanges of the foreign countries as well right and how this can be done now earlier the companies were not allowed but now since they are allowed how this access can be given so indian companies could access the overseas markets through two methods one by using american depository receipts or global depository receipts so these are the two major tools using them indian companies can access the foreign stock exchanges or second way listing their debt securities on the foreign markets both it, it can be both ways now interestingly the statement number two and statement number three are not correct for the statement why please understand when i am using american depository receipt or any global receipt basically all these receipts are negotiable certificates they are always going to be issued by depository banks always it's the depository bank which is going to issue these certificates when 
American or global depository receipts are to be used, it is the Indian company that can shell, sell its share in the global market. If it has to be vice versa, if some foreign, foreign company want to sell their share in Indian market, they have to purchase Indian depository receipts. It is as simple as that. So basically the American or global deposit actually tells us the market where they are going to get sold. So if Indian company wants to access the stock market, foreign stock market, we have to purchase the ADR or the GDR. If the foreign companies want to come and sell their stock in India, then they have to purchase our IDR as simple as that. So the, what's the problem in the, in the statement, in the question? The problem is the exchange between statement number two and three. Both are inter-exchange. You see, it says AD, in ADR, it is the foreign company can share, sell their stock in Indian market. No, Indian company has to purchase ADR to access the foreign market. And similarly, third is also wrong. Okay. Now, of course, this question was a tough one. I, I agree. This was a tough one. You can take a risk only if you have read about it. Otherwise, something you can skip because the statement is actually difficult. The, the topic of the entire capital market is tough in e economy and it becomes even complicated with statements like ADR and GDR, right? That takes us to the next question, which is open network for digital commerce, ONDC. Very, very important topic but again very complicated and little bit tough as well because it has a lot of factual information involved. What is this open network for digital commerce, ONDC? Learn about it, then we'll come back. So if you look at the ONDC, why it is so special? Because see, this is globally first of its kind initiative, open, open uh, 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 you know, network. The word open network is the key. Open networks, what, do you, what is the meaning of the term open network? See, normally you have a licensed networks, licensed softwares, which can be used only after some, you know, purchasing the license. Open networks are those where you do not need to purchase the licenses and you can customize the software as per your own needs. So, so that there comes the open network on, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, this thing, digital uh, commerce. So this is first of a kind initiative where ONDC main purpose is to democratize the digital commerce. Right now, for all type of digital commerce guys, you and me are dependent on certain platforms. Why? If I have to do my shopping, I have to go to a particular platform, Amazon, Flipkart, Mintra, Nika, so and so forth, right? But this ONDC says, we want to move away. We are not, we don't want to be dependent on any platform centric model. We want to create an open network for all aspects of buying and selling of goods and services online. So you don't really have to be dependent on the platform centric because you know these platforms, they charge heavy fees for listing your product on their platform. If I have to sell my book on Amazon, I have to give them certain amount of, the, of, the, of every sale uh, to list my book on there. And similarly, all the product have to pay right so that is why ondc says we want to democratize this digital commerce not to be platform centric but need to be open for all type of buying and selling now who has created this ondc has been incubated by dpiit department for promotion of industry internal trade they have done it at the quality council of india and they have registered themselves as a private non-profit company. Please remember, ONDC is not a public company. It is a private non-profit company. And the whole model of the ONDC is, has been modeled on the lines of the UPI because UPI is the face of the success when it comes to digitalization of India. I mean, this is, this is our face of success. So the way UPI has created the whole network and the way UPI has been able to enable the local buyer sellers, you know, they can transit over digital networks the same way. And, and, and you have, you have this uh, uh, biggest example, no, like it doesn't matter uh, whatever platform you are using, you are using Bharat pay, you are using phone pay, you are using Paytm, doesn't matter. UPI works at every platform, right? But the same way, exactly the same way we want to have the ONDC, 
which can work on any network, open network, not dependent on one particular network. Now, if you look at the question, the first and the uh, third statements are correct in this case. The only problem is with the statement number two. Why? It says the DPIIT and Quality Council of India is a public company. It is not. It's a private company and that too non-profit company. The objective of the company is not to make the profit but to make the innovation. So one and three are correct, right? Uh, of course, this was again a tough question. No, uh, uh, undoubtedly, it's a tough question. But you see, you can easily guess the statement number one. I can say, if you have a little bit information about the open networks, you can easily figure out the first statement being correct. Of course, I totally agree. The second statement was very difficult to guess because ultimately, we know that DPIIT is under the Ministry of Commerce, right? And that is going to be a Sarkari company, the public company, right? Of course, that I understand many of you must have guessed the right, but from uh, today onwards, just be more careful about this. So this Quality Council of India and DPIT, they incorporated the ONDC is actually a public company. ONDC is not a, uh, sorry, it, it is not a public company, it's a private company. So these two things are there and uh, so yeah, it was a tough one, but you could have still taken a risk uh, if you get the right approach. And uh, whenever, whenever you think, and even the third example, the third statement makes a lot of sense why we need an open network. And whenever we think of the, these kind of things, UPI is the best example that you can relate to, guys, right? Okay, moving ahead with the next uh, question number 70. Now, this question, again, is from the budget. So, I, I, I'm telling you again and again, do read about the budget and not just this budget, at least the last budget as well. So budget of 2024-25 along with 2023 and 24. Why? Because this budget was actually a full budget. This year's budget budget was just an interim budget. Of course, we are going to have another budget after uh, the election gets over and we are going to get the new government, right? But at least now for this particular year, this last budget becomes really, really important with a star mark. So do read about the last full budget that we had. As per the budget, we know very, very well that India is world for fifth largest economy. Yes, India has a GDP of 3.5 trillion, but and we are still considered as a developing nation. So I think every statement is very well uh, speaking about itself. Now look at the statement number two. First is correct. Fine. Look at the second one. And this is very general information. If you are reading, if you read newspaper daily, you have these all these knowledges. It says India currently the world's third largest economy. Yes, we are third largest, but in what terms? We are third largest in terms of purchasing power parity. India is fifth largest based on the nominal GDP size. In fact, if you read the first statement and then you look at the second, both looks very contradictory. The first statement itself says that India is fifth largest economy because of the GDP size. So even the second statement looks very contradictory and you can easily rule out the statement being wrong. Then it says India is second largest recipient of remittances of the world. No, not at all. We are largest, not the second. We are the largest recipient of remittances. What is a remittance guys? Remittance very simple. If any Indian is working abroad, you are working in USA, you are working in Middle East and you are sending uh, their currency back to India, to your home, that is what we call as remittances. Remittances are very, very important. Remittances contribute a lot in maintaining the forex of a country. So the more Indians working outside, sending back money to their home, actually <clears throat> bulks up the forex of our country, right? So very, very interesting and important thing. So of course, we are the largest and this is a well-known fact all over the world. So please eliminate number two as well. Then it says multi as per the budget, multidimensional poverty. Yes, one thing very interestingly in India in the last couple of years, the multidimensional poverty is actually falling. I'm not sure. Let's say I'm not sure about the percentage exactly, but at least I'm, I know that the multidimensional poverty is falling, right? It is falling in the last 10 to 15 years. And this decline is more than 75%. That is also correct. So first and fourth, both statements are correct. 
easily you can eliminate number two and number three i would say this was a very easy question only two statements are correct based on your journal knowledge you can solve it you don't really have to be good with the numbers even if you have not read economic survey if you have not read well on on the budget you can still give the right answers by understanding this concept uh, when it comes to the remittances uh, just try to remember one thing that india being a largest recipient of the remittances how much we are receiving in 2022 alone india received more than 100 billion us dollar as remittances in fact because because being the largest recipient of remittances india's position today is such that india has six largest forex reserves in the world now do you know which country has the largest forex reserve do you know which country is at first position in terms of forex if you know the name do let me know in the comment below guys now that takes us to the next question question number 71 this question is about the Yamuna froth. What is the Yamuna froth? What is the meaning of the frothing? So you must have seen last year, the, the pollution levels of Yamuna were very much in the news. When I use the word froth, frothing means, uh, frothing is, is actually a sign. Frothing is you have, you have a lot of, uh, you know, on the, on the rivers, you have lots of bubbles. It looks like as if a, uh, as if these are bubbles of some kind of detergent or some kind of soap. So frothing is that one particular sign which tells you that the, the river is having exceptionally high pollution levels. And unfortunately in India, Yamuna is one such river that had recently witnessed the frothing means exceptionally high levels of pollution. What exactly contributes to frothing? So we have the phosphates and we have the surfactants. So both, both of them are untreated sewage and industrial effluents. And mainly from, from, the, from the industries, uh, from nearby areas of Delhi, Haryana, UP, all the three areas and their untreated sewage industrial effluents, they are all going into the river Yamuna. And phosphates, which are generally found in all detergents, fertilizers and human waste and surfactants that reduces water surface tension are found in detergents, industrial discharge. Both of them contribute heavily to the, to the uh, phenomena, to the, fun, to the you know, full making of this froth that we have, right? So yes, now if you look at the uh, statements, so I think both statements look very good, very uh, normal. Uh, frothing is correct and even you know the phosphates and surfactants both are given right so yes this was a this was again an easy question easily you can attempt it both statements are absolutely correct you think of the yamuna think of the nearby state which 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 states are nearby so you have everything correct because you know which states are the nearing states of yamuna so even with the common sense this can be easily solved frothing high levels of pollution yes common Question number 72, this is about global environment facility, not, ju not just this question. In general also I am telling you guys, do read more on global environment facility. It is a must prepare topic, must and must prepare topic. Currently this global environment facility is holding, it, 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 it is responsible for the funding mechanism of the most important six treaties, most important six global treaties funding management is done by the global environment facility. So do read and prepare it. Well, the number one says global and okay, first let's let's get in onto some of the uh, information. So yes, the global environment facility, uh, this GEF, it served as operating entity of the financial mechanism since UNFCC entered into the force 1994. And not just these two, it says that it managed two special funds. Special Climate Change Fund is under the GEF. Least Developed Countries Fund is also under this. And other than that, there are so many global treaties, including the latest one, including the latest coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. Even its funding is also going to be under GEF. So it's a very, very important topic for you to prepare. And if it would be great, if somebody can do a research and tell us in the comment box 
which are all the treaties or which are all the frameworks whose funding is the responsibility of GF. If you know or if you can search about it, do let us know in the comment box which are all the treaties that are funded or the funding is done by the mechanism. So here both statements are correct. C, this question was an easy one, should have attempted very easily. Okay, now question 73, very difficult Typical question of economy. It says Lewis model on labor industrialization. What is this Lewis model? Now the keyword is labor, keyword is industrialization. So in this in these kind of questions, I always say start by elimination. First of all, you don't have to figure out the right statement. Try to try to at least eliminate the wrong statement, which you think can never be the answer. Labor industrialization, eliminate number D. It is about closed economy. No, not at all, not relatable. First statement you can eliminate also. It says economic theory, inflation, unemployment have stable inverse relationship, not at all. At least I am in a position to eliminate. So in this kind of question, always start by eliminating the things. Now my only confusion is between B and C. So in this case, I still have an option to take certain kind of risk, right? Well, the right answer in this case is actually going to be, actually going to be option, which option? First read about it, it's option B actually. So what exactly Lewis model says? Very interesting model guys. The Lewis model says, it assumes that there is a dual economy. Dual economy in, in uh, uh, with traditional agriculture and modern industry. There is a dual economy. Why I am calling it as a dual economy? See, this model says that our agriculture model has zero or negative marginal labor productivity. Means, even if few workers are going to leave agriculture, still the overall output is, is not going to decrease. Because we know that in agriculture, there is already surplus workers. No, agriculture already has it already has surplus workers and because it has surplus workers which we call as disguised unemployment disguised employment means where 10 people let's say 10 people are doing amount x of work and even five people are capable of doing the same without any compromise so these five that you have employed extra it is disguised employment they are not really contributing or making difference in the output, right? Interestingly. So this Lewis model says, from agriculture, even if few labor are going to go away, it does not really impact the output of the agriculture. But the industrial sector has a positive marginal labor productivity. That means if I am going to add few labor in the industries, that's surely going to increase the output. So you can understand that modern industry has a direct relationship to the number of labor and productivity. Whereas agriculture need not to have direct relation with the number and productivity of the workers or the labors, right? So this model is actually very important and relevant in today's world as well. Because this model, as per this model where, where it says, that the extra surplus agriculture workers, they should move to the modern sectors of industries. Why the extra labor force from agriculture? Because see, in India, if I say, India's 60% workforce, 60% workforce of India still is working in agriculture and elite sectors, right? So you can imagine how important it is for that surplus workers to leave agriculture and move to the industrial sector or the modern sectors. This is going to solve two problems if that happens. Number one, of course, if more workers are going to work in industries, it will boost industrialization. Number two, it will solve the problem of disguised employment in the agriculture, right? So in this case, the right answer is supposed to be B. Of course, this question was, I would say it was a tough question. This model is not very much very famous model or something that you read on a regular basis, but still you can take a risk. Why? The way I have eliminated the wrong ones. So first eliminate the obvious wrongs, then you may end up finding the obvious right. Next question 74 is about 
insolvency bankruptcy code this code was brought in 2016 even today it is one of the most important code do prepare this topic for the upcoming prelims as well so first let's see what this ibc is all about so insolvency bankruptcy code the main objective what is what is the meaning of the term insolvency insolvency is when a company is not able to pay their debt if a company has so much of debt and they are not in a position to repay that term is called as insolvency and when you declare officially you declare your insolvency that practice is called bankruptcy so you become bankrupt only when you declare your insolvency right so main objective so insolvency bankruptcy code makes sense in your head so this is going to talk about those kind of business companies which are making losses which are not in a position to repay their debt that for that kind of corporate that kind of companies we have got the ibc code main objective very simple to resolve the bankruptcy crisis in the corporate sector again not just the corporate sector but the but also to consolidate the insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings and the purpose is to revive the company in a time bound manner if a company has gone into the loop of insolvency bankruptcy this code is going to help you out and help you to get revive from that uh, loop on on which particular parties ibc code is applicable applicable on individual corporates partnership limited liability partners even the personal guarantors to the corporate debtor so as far as the application is concerned it has very wide application right now very interestingly <clears throat> uh, uh another thing you know if there is any uh, insolvency proceeding all insolvency proceedings can be initiated either by the creditor like the banks can initiate because or not just the bank can be any creditor whosoever has invested the money in the company or given the loan to the company even creditor can initiate the insolvency proceedings or even the loaner the defaulter can initiate or can self declare that i am not in position to repay my debts but whenever you have to proceed for the insolvency proceedings it is always done by submitting a plea to the educating authority and who and or which is the educating educating authority in the ibc code it is going to be national companies law tribunal once your plea is accepted then insolvency resolution professional is going to be appointed right and then the further process starts so remember the educating authority remember the procedure as well in this case guys all the three statements are absolutely correct without any problem so you can see the right answer being all the three now this question of course i would say this question was a medium one but guys if you know the meaning of insolvency bankruptcy plus this is not a new code from 2016 and i'm sure so far you guys must have read it multiple times so i do not see any question or any statement to be tough it is very the, the statements of the ipc are very very normal so yeah this can be attempted in a very easy manner only expected information is asked in the question not something that you can say sir this was a twist or turn question 75 again from economy it says it, it talks about rupee depreciation first you need to know the concept and what actually contributes to depreciation of the rupee is something we have to focus upon now which statement is not correct the the statement is not correct be careful so let's first understand the rupee depreciation so in very in a very general manner if i use the word sir rupee depreciation depreciation is decreasing decreasing of what rupee de depreciation means if there is a decline in the value of indian rupee against other foreign currency so you say there was a time sir when one uh, uh, you know us dollar used to be like 70 rupees right and now it says sir one us dollar now is let's say 82 rupees so what you say you can see sir it seems our indian rupee value has depreciated because now to get 1 dollar i need to have i need to spend more indian rupee right so this is a case where you can say sir rupees value has declined and it is not in isolation when uh, when i say 
decline in the value of any currency it is always taken in a relative manner we always compare our currency with some other foreign currencies particularly the us dollar because that is the uh, that is still the currency which is widely used and widely accepted it means it takes more money to buy one dollar example is in front of you okay now please understand rupee depreciation is going to have positive as well as negative effects of course majorly it has negative effects why negative effects now since your value of indian rupees decline so whatever import we are making so for all the import i have to pay more money now for all my imports i am going to pay more indian rupee and that go, paying more indian rupee because uh, for import my value is decline so more and more import burden is going to be on us but what is the positive way the positive is only one there is only one positive or majorly one positive effect and that is with respect to exports if my rupees value is less so of course there is a chance that i can still boost my exports why because indian goods are now cheaper for the foreign people all indian goods now they have become cheaper because our value of money has declined no it becomes cheaper for all the foreign markets and there is a chance that a lot of foreigners now may show interest to buy indian goods because being cheaper and here is a chance to boost our exports more and more but of course this this not always work sometimes even the even uh, you know country like china sometimes countries like china china they deliberately depreciate their value so as to make their uh, to keep their exports competitive but uh, for that to happen you need to first have a very fine strong base of manufacturing that's where the problem happens in india india is still not able to get the benefit of rupee depreciation in terms of boosting exports because because our uh, manufacturing base is not as strong as china okay that is important for you now what actually what are the reasons for these rupee depreciation there are many many reasons and some of the major reasons include number 1 the trade imbalance means if i am importing more 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 i am exporting less 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 so when my imports are more than the export it is always going to hurt the value of the local currency leading to the depreciation similarly guys higher inflation also erodes the value of the of your currency the more inflation you your currency your currency's purchasing power is going to get eroded so high inflation is an another reason for rupee depreciation sometimes what happens if your country's uh, if if, uh, uh, if if your country's central bank reduces or lower the interest rates for for foreign investors of course why people will invest money in india if our rbi decides to give less interest to the foreign investors they will not invest in india further they will rather pick up their money and they will go to some other foreign market where they are going to get larger interest rate and we have seen recently we have seen recently when uh, the united states federal bank the federal bank of us when they has increased their interest rates lot of money lot of investments actually moved out of india and people started investing again in the us federal markets so whenever the lowering interest rates has a negative impact where uh, where investors find indian market less attractive that again lead to the depreciation of indian rupee another another causes can be speculation maybe because of political economic uh, stability external debt factors global economic conditions so all these contribute ultimately to the rupee depreciation or the money uh, value depreciation which statement is not correct first i have no problem with first is absolutely correct now this is a very simple definition everyone can simply understand look at the second one it says decrease demand of the foreign currencies for import can pressure the domestic currency no apply your logic if i don't have demand for the import it is going to be boosting for the domestic currency why would it put a pressure on on the currency 
the pressure is put on the currency only when I have to import more and I have to pay in the foreign currencies. So clearly logic, very logical, basic knowledge of economy can help you out. This statement is wrong. So which statement is not correct? B is not correct. Very easy question. Very simple with basic knowledge of, um, with a very basic knowledge you are in a position to solve it. Okay, I hope that is clear to everyone. Now that brings us to the next topic that is called global carbon project. What this global carbon project is, first try to understand and then we'll come back to the question. Now this is a very interesting and important question. Let's figure it out, figure it out guys. So talking about the global uh, carbon budget, global carbon project or global carbon uh, uh, budget are both interrelated. How? Let's see. So very first thing, what is the meaning of global carbon budget? As the name says, as the name says, it refers to the maximum cumulative global human based or human initiated anthropogenic CO2 emissions that can be released from the pre-industrial era to when such emissions reach the net zero. It's a, it's a time frame. Global carbon budget says how much the maximum value of the carbon emissions that humans can do comparing it to the pre-industrial level till we reach to the net zero. Net zero is a very interesting case. So many times in the news you see that the country is committing to become net zero. In, even India has a target. By 2070, India aims to become net zero. Net zero does not mean I am not going to emit the carbon emission. Net zero simply mean a condition where all my carbon emissions are going to be balanced by absorbing or removing the same amount. Whatever carbon emission I am going to make, I am also going to absorb the same amount. So my net effect is going to be zero. So that does not mean that carbon emissions will not be there. It, they will be there, but equivalent amount are going to be absorbed, removed from the atmosphere. Okay, the purpose. Why this is so important? Of course, normally what budget means? Budget means how much is outgoing, how much is incoming, right? So when it comes to global carbon budget, why it is important? It is absolutely necessary if you really want to limit the global warming to specific levels, right? For that purpose, it is absolutely important. And recently, the Indian gov uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, better known as IPCC, has released their sixth assessment report. Now, my suggestion to every aspirant, please do read about the sixth assessment report of the IPC. Star mark, in fact, double star mark, absolutely important. Expect one or two questions coming from this also. So, IPCC sixth assessment report has clearly shown that the world has already warmed at 1.0 degrees Celsius until 2019. The maximum limit we are targeting is 1.5 degree till the end of 21st century's end. And just by 2019, we already have increased the level of temperature by more than 1%, you see. So it says, as per the report, it clearly says, four-fifths of the global budget is already depleted. We are getting warmed up even faster than expected. Understood? Now, very interestingly, the first statement is making all the sense, but what about the other information? Please read. It says, as per the IPCC report, the developed countries, obviously we know this fact. If you, if you see all the developed countries, they obviously have um, they have emitted more carbons so far because they are, they are the one they have gone industrialization at a very faster pace. So developed countries have disproportionately claimed a larger share of the global carbon budget so far because, because there is a very interesting concept called as common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. You know guys, all the developed countries Historically, they are more responsible for the carbon emissions. The developing countries or least developed countries, they have still not peaked in terms of their carbon emission. So historically, it is, it is the responsibility of a developed country more, more to take the responsibility of the carbon emission because it is their activity that has actually making all the world suffer. South Asia, including India, we are still 
though india in absolute number india is the fourth largest country in terms of carbon emission but if you compare if you compare with the per capita carbon emission entire south asia has contributed only 4% of the historical carbon emission you see only 4% now there is a list in front of you i want to see you this list look at this list guys if if you want to see the real culp culprits in terms of carbon emission contribution you see north america usa canada these countries in north america 23% contribution alone by these two countries including mexico but majorly canada and us then europe who now is talking about the hypocritic statements of carbon this and carbon that and climate this climate that they are responsible for 16% if you look at south asia including india we are so less we are still 4% equivalent to australia japan new zealand you see and and uh, uh, then middle east is the one which is still lesser than us and international shipping aviation they are only 2% but look at the other countries how can they say that everyone has a same responsibility no it does it, it it doesn't work like that now if you go back to the question you would say sir first statement to absolutely correct the carbon budget the global carbon budget the word itself is self explanatory and that tells about tells us uh, the thing that that is there what is wrong with the third statement look at the third statement it says india south asia are we contributing 15% historical emission no just 4% even europe is 16 we are lesser we are so much less in that terms so eliminate number 3 then it says as per the ipcc 6 report is it the developing countries that are disproportionately claimed a higher share no why would developing country ask for larger responsibility they are not historically responsible it is the developed countries the developed countries are responsible more so disproportionately they are claiming for larger share of the global carbon budget right so second is wrong first is right so in, i think i think even if you are not in a position to understand the global carbon project for uh, don't get panic by the name don't think that this is too specific just apply your common sense are you not in a position to eliminate number 3 of course we can eliminate we know about india that we are not contributing even if you are not aware about the number at least you know that okay this is too much i have not uh, i must have not contributed 15% right and even the second statement is easy to predict why a developing country common sense so even if you are in a position to eliminate number 2 you are likely to get your answer so the the question was a medium question uh, you can still take a risk because you are in a position to eliminate you have a space to eliminate some of the statement guys okay that takes us to the question number 77 where the question is about the hindsight bias this is interesting very straight forward question what is the meaning of the term hindsight bias because this relates to equity market Now, very interestingly first look at that look at try to learn it then we'll come back so in general what is the meaning of hindsight bias now interestingly hindsight bias and which is very very oftenly used in uh, global equity market but in general what exactly the hindsight bias is it is when a tenant of behavioral economics it is a major determinant of equity market a common behavior of a person you know our economic sense is actually controlled by our economic behavior hindsight bias very clearly says that there is going to be a cognitive bias Cogni cognition cognitive biases that is in our brain that is a that is a preconceived notion in our brain it is the it is the it is the already fixed bias in our head that make people overestimate the predictability of the past events you must have heard lot of people saying oh i knew it all along you know so some people they overestimate the predictability of the past events and that actually lead them making poor decisions about economic investments and policies now this is what you call as hindsight bias if you go back to the question you see you have this very clear answer as c so hindsight bias is a psychological phenomena allowing people to conceive themselves 
after an event that they act accurately predicted it before it happened. Oh, I knew it all along kind of phenomena, which is also called as creeping determinism. So, of course, this question was not an easy one. It was a tough one. I understand this was a tough one. I will not recommend you to take a risk. Don't attempt it without logic. You can skip because this was a tough question. I understand. But now you know the answer, right? So now we, we hope that this is going to come in your exam and you are going to excel in the question, guys. Next is very typical uh, UPSC pattern where you have to figure out which statement is correctly matched or not. So you have three initiatives for bioeconomy. First of all, what exactly is the meaning of bioeconomy? You need to learn that. So what exactly is bioeconomy, guys? When, when I use the word bioeconomy, I'm actually talking about the sustainable production, utilization, conservation of the biological resources so as to provide good service information across all the sectors of economy for a sustainable economy. So there are the two words. One is biological resources and another is the economics behind it. So how I'm going to very sustainably going to produce, use, conserve the biological resources so as I am in a position to provide good service information to all sectors in a very sustainable manner. That is bioeconomy. When it comes to bioeconomy, there are few important initiatives started by government of India. Number one is National Biopharma Mission started by the government 2017. The main purpose was to accelerate the biopharmaceutical development in India. National Biopharma Mission is a joint initiative of Department of Biotech plus even the World Bank is a partner. Very, very important information. Do remember it. The mission has an aim to foster the entrepreneurship, indigenous manufacturing in the biopharma sector by creating that kind of ecosystem. Then in terms of bioeconomy, there are two another important, uh, uh, you know, initiatives. One is called BioNest. This BioNest initiative started by Birak. And it is about fostering the biotech innovation ecosystem in India. In fact, by through this uh, initiative of BioNest, Birak has been, uh, has been able to support 65 bio incubators that are actually going to have bigger long-term goals or long-term uh, you know, uh, projects for the bioeconomy. National Mission on Bioeconomy is another initiative by Government of India launched in 2016 under Ministry of Science and Tech. Major aim of this national mission is to boost the rural economy. Okay, be careful about which, which project is doing what. Another important point. Now, under the bio, National Mission on Bioeconomy, our aim is to promote the bioeconomy across various sectors including agriculture, forestry, biotechnology, healthcare, industrial biotechnology, across all the sectors we are targeting. Now, if you come back to the question, very easy, now it has become. So, so we have National Biopharma, yes, be careful about the World Bank. See, in India, I'm just giving you a hint. If, if there are 10 initiatives, let's say, in India, and if you are supposed to guess that out of the 10 projects, which organization must be contributing maximum as a, as a multilateral bank? Maximum number of chances like 6 out of 10 are contributed by the World Bank. So World Bank has always been a very important development partner for India. And similarly is the case with bioeconomy in India. So all three are correct. Absolutely. BioNest by Birak, yes. National Mission Bio, uh, Bioeconomy, Ministry of Science and Tech. Okay, very important. And please, one more thing, even this Department of Biotechnology, this bio DBT also works under the science and technology. So this is too specific information. So here uh, the question was medium one, but something you could have attempted easily uh, considering knowing about the bioeconomy as well. Okay, okay. One interesting fact. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more on bioeconomy status in India, so please let me tell you guys, India's bioeconomy is actually growing at an insane level. In the last 10 years only, India's bioeconomy has grown from 10 billion to 120 billion. You see, 12 times jump India has seen in the last 10 years. And in fact, by 2030, 
India's bioeconomy is estimated to be around 300 billion dollars. India is among the top 3 in South Asia in bioeconomy and top 12 destinations for biotechnology in the world. But India why top 3? Which are the other two countries? Can you tell me guys? Can you tell me the name of the other two countries in South Asia which are also growing as bioeconomy giant? If you know the answer, do let me know in the comment section box. And in fact, the best part behind India's such tremendous growth is because India has the second highest number of US FDA approved manufacturing plants outside the US that has actually contributed to the growth of India's bioeconomy. The next question we have is with respect to the government securities called GSEC. Very very important but basic concept of economy. Can is it only the uh, central government that is going to trade the government securities? No, absolutely no. Government securities can also be issued by state government as well. But of course, there are some terms and conditions that we will learn. But you see, you can eliminate this option straightforward because it says only and that makes some, you know, problematic thing in our head. Then the second statement says all four type of GSEC. There are four types of government securities and central government can issue all four types. Of course, central government can issue all the four types. First, you need to learn about the government securities, right? So, uh, what exactly is the meaning of government securities? Government securities are those, those tradable instruments. Tradable means can be, can be purchased, can be sold. That, mean, that makes the word tradable. So, um, Government, basically, if government wants to get some money, government uh, wants to get some loan, government securities is one of the way government can do that. So, government securities are tradable instruments which can be issued by both state and central governments. Government securities can be of short term, can be of long term. In economy, in terms of securities, when I say short term security means where the maturity period is less than one year. That is a short term. If the maturity period is going to be more than one year, then it becomes a long term security. Now, now from this point, be careful. There are four types of government securities, fine. And these four types are treasury bills, cash management bills, dated securities and state development loans. First of all, be prepared to have a separate question on government securities types as well like each and individual all all of them deserve one mcq as a separate one where the government uh, is in position to issue all four types the state government can issue only and only sdl only and only the state government cannot issue the treasury bill cannot issue the cb cmb or dated securities these three are to be issued only by center government where the state development loans can be issued by both state as well as center. Now why there are so much interest in the government securities because there is practically no risk of default. Why? Are government securities are government instruments. To, to repay your money it is government responsibility and what better and secure than the government itself? No. Here the government has its guarantee behind it. That makes government securities as risk-free guild edge instruments. Though the interest rates are less, but they are very, very safe instruments. So if you come here, of course, you, you know the answer. The first statement is not correct, sir. First is incorrect. The second is correct. So my answer is going to be B. Very easy question. Very simple. But do read about the treasury bill, CBM. Everything is absolutely important. That brings us to the last question. I would say this was a tough question. Why? Because the question is asking you about the North Macedonia borders. Not something we are very familiar with, right? So this was a tough one. And I'm sure many of you must have skipped it. Because guessing the borders of North Macedonia is a challenging task unless until you have not done a PhD on the maps. So if you, if you look at the North Macedonia, so here are the, uh, you know, all the neighbors. So Greece is one neighbor, Bulgaria, Serbia, Kosovo, Kosovo and Albania. These are the five, uh, uh, you know, neighboring countries of North Macedonia. So now, and, and it's a landlocked country, by the way. 
overall you can see there is all the countries are there and landlocked means the country not having access to the open water that is called landlocked country right so now you can easily uh, eliminate the options so you have learned bulgaria being one greece serbia is romania a, a border country no hungary no but this question was a tough one the answer is only three but i would suggest please skip if you are not very comfortable because you can't apply any logic it is only and only about the facts so now i hope you have learned a lot of information guys that is all from my side in the part number four hope you have enjoyed and learned a lot from this video so what is your feedback on this video do let me know in the comment section box stay tuned with us and do check out our test series a lot more is coming out on the youtube channel that's all from my side best wishes for the upcoming exam and now you know the date has uh, been changed right now upsc exam is not going to be on 26th uh, may because of the elections the date has been extended to 16th of june so now you have 20 extra days my suggestion don't waste please invest in those 20 days try to practice more and more this is your golden chance to increase 20 days can make all the difference trust me so all my best wishes to you guys lots of love take care jai hind jai bharat